Well, good morning. I'm not the new pastor. Hey, he wears that slim fit suit way better than I could. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you this morning. Uh, I think I about lost my voice on that last song because it's at the top of my range and I want to hit every note. And uh, so if anybody heard me, I apologize. But uh, the word says, the angels proclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Day and night they proclaim that in heaven. So you better believe he's holy. Uh, I love that song. So we're going to start in uh, Matthew chapter 15. If you can turn there. While I share a little bit of my journey uh, on your bulletin, it does say Dr. Dana Watson. I hate it because uh, it's not me, you know, uh, but I did work for that. And so I started, uh, I think in September 2013 on that degree and uh, it took me about five and a half years. And so uh, I'm sharing that with you because I want to segue into my sermon. I had a friend that, oh, that went along with me in my coursework. Uh, his name was Wes. He's still my friend. And um, we, uh, we connected initially. Uh, we were in like a web online class and we were like chatting back and forth. Well, there were three, reason, three reasons why we connected. One was uh, he, he loves Alabama, Crimson Tide, and I'm a fan, right? And then uh, he lives in the... Uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. This is where I went to school when I was in seminary, so I'm familiar with that area, and I love Texas. And if I didn't live in Alabama, I'd probably live in Texas. Um, and then the third thing is he, he was a pastor of a church. So he went, he went to seminary. Uh, he, he left seminary to begin pastoring this church, very first church, and so a very successful, prominent church in the area, uh, large congregation. And so he'd been there 18 years. And uh, first church, first job, and uh, raised his, his two girls there and his wife. Uh, they both served there. And so, um, you know, we just became friends, talking to each other, and uh, you know, about, you know, we call each other, text each other about an assignment, uh, what are you going to do, are you, how far along are you in, the, in this paper? And so, one day I was in Sunday school, and uh, Sunday school was about o- over, and uh, I heard that Lane Kiffin uh, was getting a divorce, like it popped up on my ESPN app, and for whatever reason, I thought that was something that Wes needed to know about. So, I texted him, I said, hey, have you heard about this? And uh, he called me immediately. And uh, it was kind of weird. So I just declined the call and I was still talking. And so I left the, the Sunday school class. I went to an empty room and I called Wes back. And I uh, said, hey man, what's up? He said, well, I just wanted you to know something. Um, my wife and I, we separated. So we're going through a tough time right now and just be praying for us and my girls. And he said, I can't really explain what happened, but you know, I just want you to know about it and, and just pray. And so the next time I went to Philadelphia for coursework. He and I sat in a Mexican restaurant about 10 o'clock at night. He just told me what was going on in his life. So basically what happens, he, he went to a, a high school reunion, saw this girl. They weren't really friends, never dated in high school, but they just began to talk to each other. And so that began uh, a text relationship, which progressed into a let's meet for, for coffee kind of thing. And then it progressed on to even uh, more. And, uh, and he said, you know, it, it it was more than I wanted it to be, uh, and I had to tell my wife. And so he told his wife, and she was not happy about it. So she ended up separating from him, and, and, uh, and he was devastated. Uh, but he did make a, a bad choice. He sinned. Uh, he understood that. But I asked myself, how did my friend get here? And the truth is, it can happen to any of us. Sin can get into our hearts and our lives, uh, and, and we're all capable of falling in to some sort of sin and committing some egregious act. Sin is not to be taken lightly. Uh, There's an old saying I heard growing up in church. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. And there's truth in that statement. If you've ever gotten into sin and uh, allowed it to control your life, you think about someone who's who's addicted to alcohol or drugs or or anything else, it takes them further than they want to go, keeps them longer than they want to stay, costs them more than they want to pay. But the good news is, Jesus is greater than any of your sins. And his grace is sufficient to blot out every stain. There is grace in Jesus. So we must come to a realization that our hearts uh, are are where sin can hide. Our hearts is where uh, we begin uh, deciding whether or not we're going to follow Christ or whether or not we're going to make a a right decision or or a bad decision. Jesus Jesus even talked about it. He said if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, then you have committed murder. 
Um, and so the, just the uh, spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law is there. So if we look in Matthew chapter 15, um, we'll see the Pharisees. And it says, Then the Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem to Jesus and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Jesus answered them and said, Why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? And so they came trying to discredit Jesus, trying to point out you know, that his disciples were breaking the tradition of the elders. It's interesting that, that Jesus does not answer their question directly, but responds with a much greater question of his own. His disciples were breaking the tradition of the elders, which was the Pharisees put laws around God's law to protect God's law. So if it says you, you can't work on the Sabbath, well, what does that really mean? What is work? So I said, okay, well, you, the Pharisees said, well, you can only walk so many steps on a Sunday. But then the laws that were made by the Pharisees became as great as God's law. But Jesus knew the difference between the tradition of the elders and God's law. And so he points that out, that they're breaking God's commandment. But in the next passage, Jesus points out that they were breaking God's law with their tradition. The Pharisees were so worried about following the the tradition and giving their tithe to the temple that they were forsaking the needs of others, specifically their own parents. So in chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, whoever tells his father or mother whatever benefit you have uh, might have received from me as a gift to be committed to the temple, he does not uh, have to honor his father. In this way, you have revoked God's word because of your tradition. So they have gone so far as to break God's law by their tradition. So, uh, so if we look at our church, churches today, you could probably think of some traditions that we have that are maybe stemmed from some of God's commandments, uh, but aren't exactly in line with God's commandments. So one thing, uh, you know, I speak at churches, I travel around, and there was a church that's just north of uh, Crayola. And so I never know what to wear. So I generally just show up in a coat and a tie. I didn't wear a tie today because I knew you'd forgive me. And so I never really know what to wear. But coat and tie, you're pretty safe. You can always take it off. I did an interim for uh, Sunrise Baptist Church. And the first Sunday I showed up with a coat and tie, they told me to take it off. Take the coat and tie. You don't have to wear that here. You know, we're very casual. First Sunday, I wore the coat and tie. Second Sunday, I went without the tie. And then third Sunday, I went without the coat and tie. So... I kind of, you know, eased up. But I, I was at this church, and uh, I sat on the front row. And the pastor there, he had on a coat and tie. He turned to me, and he said, Hey, uh, young man, I'm glad that you wore a coat and tie, because I believe anybody who preaches the gospel from the pulpit needs to wear a coat and tie. So I was glad that I wore it, uh, but I'm no theologian. But I'm pretty sure that Peter, when he came down from the upper room and preached, and 3,000 people were saved, he was not wearing a coat and tie. So sometimes our traditions could get in the way. Things that we think are important might not be as important as we believe they are. And so Jesus responds with an Old Testament prophecy the Pharisees would have surely known. And it turns out to be a direct indictment on them. He says, hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching us doctrines to the commands of men. The Pharisees became the masters of masquerade. Uh, they had become so much uh, about the outward appearance, uh, that they lost sight of what mattered, their own heart. They wanted to be seen and respected as religious leaders. And what started out with good in- intentions begins to birth out, what began to birth out of a de- desire to worship God, to protect God's law over time, it became a heart issue. Uh, Sometimes we can go through the emotions and we put emphasis on doing right things or good things rather than honoring God with our hearts and our thoughts. So we can very easily become like the Pharisees. We want people to see that we do good things. We, we show up to church and we're good people and, and uh, we help others uh, and we want to be seen for that. It's also easy to be enamored by the ideal you rather than accepting the real you. You ever thought about that? Some, some people like the thought of their reputation or their character being lifted up when really it's just an outward appearance. My behavior may not really reflect my heart, but over time it will. So we'll look at that in a second. So if we're not careful, we can become just like the Pharisees. So I like to say doing good because it feels good is no good. Doing good because it feels good is no good. 
It's selfish. If you do good things because it makes you feel good, that's selfish. If you do good things because you want to help someone, because you love people and you love the Lord, that's different. But what if doing good didn't feel good? What if doing good actually kind of pained you, kind of hurt? Would you still do good? Would you do the things that you knew would honor God? True disciples do good with nothing expected in return. They love people and disciples make more disciples. So if you're not doing those three things, you need to check your heart. You need to see where you stand with the Father. The Bible says that uh, when we love God and we honor him and we obey him, we bear fruit. We begin to have characteristics in our life. So if I would just be in God's presence and read his word, all those things I want to, to be outwardly just begin to happen because my heart changes, my mind changes, and then my actions begin to change as well. So in chapter, I'm sorry, in verse 10, it says, some, some, have seen the, some have seen the crowd. He told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. The Pharisees surely gasped in, in disbelief at what he was saying because the law very much outlines the things uh, that the Jewish people could not eat, like pork and meat and shrimp. How could Jesus say these things? How could he say what goes in the mouth does not defile a man? They truly believed that it did. The disciples even acknowledged that what Jesus said likely angered the Pharisees. In verse 12, he says, Then the disciples came to him uh, and told him, Do you uh, know that the Pharisees took offense to what they heard uh, when they heard the statement? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant uh, will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guides the blind, both will fall into a pit. Then Peter replied to him, Explain this parable to us. And Jesus said, are even you still lacking understanding? He said, don't you realize that whatever goes to the mouth passes through the stomach and is eliminated? I don't mean to be crass, but what Jesus is saying here is what goes into the, into the stomach is going to come out defiled anyway. So what goes in is not what's important, but what comes out. Uh, then Jesus gets to the main issue that the disciples have. He says, but when it comes out of the, what comes out of the mouth is from the heart and this defiles a man. Jesus is pressing beyond the outward appearance and superficial. The Pharisees were a perfect example of, of people who were just doing things outwardly, ritualistically. Doing things t- so that people would look at them and say, oh, man, they, they've got it all together. And sometimes we do that in our own lives. We put out a facade. We put out uh, this image that we have it all together. And we really don't. Deep inside we know we're broken and we need a savior. Jesus even says later in Matthew... Woe to you, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, uh, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. First clean the cup inside and the dish and the outside will be clean too. So just like I said, if you focus on your heart and your mind, the things that you say and the, th- I mean, the things you think and the things that are inside of you, then the outside will follow. So I had a, um, there was a lady, uh, on my Facebook page, uh, went to my church, but not this church. And uh, <clears throat> she wrote on her page, she said, Dear God, I'm so thankful that you have blessed me with a lawnmower so that I could cut my neighbor's grass when hers broke down. I thought, well, that's a good thing, right? But the Bible says, do good in secret so your father will reward you in secret. So she had her reward. What was that? Likes on Facebook and comments about how good a person she was. But if she had done it in secret, God would have honored her in secret. But she chose to put it out there the way that she did. And sometimes uh, people do that. And it's, it's not necessarily a terrible thing. But if you're going to receive reward from the Father, uh, do those things in secret. Uh, at the very core of who we are lies our hearts, our will, and our choices. But because at the, at the core, it's under the surface, it's not seen. So who we really are is not seen. And so sometimes there are places in our hearts and minds that... That unless we really ask the Holy Spirit to show us, there's places where sin can hide. But Jesus is telling us, telling us that what, in our, what is in our hearts, our deepest desires and intentions will surface whether we like it or not. So uh, how many people in here grill? Who's grill master? Okay, got a couple of guys in here? A couple of ladies? Uh, I am not a griller. I cannot cook. I can do, here's what I can do. I can do chili, spaghetti, and pasta roni. That's me. Right? So, but my wife is really trying to help me become 
uh, a griller. So how she does this is she goes out and she buys steaks or chicken or pork loin or whatever and says, hey, cook this on the grill. And so she thinks I'm going to get practice and then I'm going to get like better at it. But generally, like just practice. Uh, it's expensive practice too because those meats aren't cheap. So I get out there. I'm trying to do the best I can. Is it hot enough? Am I keeping it on long enough? Is it internal temperature? Is it high enough? I don't really know what to do. But most of the time I end up just like burning it to a crisp. Uh, and so then I ruin supper. Um, but it's, it's fine. It's just, I, I, I'm just not a griller. So uh, I have a gas grill. I bought it for the purpose of learning to grill. And uh, it's probably rusted now. But I, I went outside and uh, uh, had a new grill. So it has three burners. And so the rule is, if you want to start the grill, you turn on the first burner. And then you click the igniter, right? So I thought, well, I'll just turn them all on. And then, you know, click the igniter. And it'll just, you know, it'll start faster. I won't have to wait so long. So I turned all the burners on and I clicked the igniter. But it didn't, it didn't ignite. It was clicking, but it wasn't sparking. I was like, oh, well. So I, I went inside. Yeah? And I got one of those long, uh, you know, lighters. Walked back out. I wasn't thinking. This thing had probably been on like 60 seconds, maybe longer. And I just stuck it right in the middle of that uh, grill. And I, I struck it. And it's whoosh, like a big flame of fire just, you know, in my face. And it scared me to death. Um, but I just wasn't thinking about it. And, you know, sin in our life can be the same way. Where it's down on the surface, you can't see it. And it's low, but it's building up. And all of a sudden, just one match causes a big flame, causes you to explode, causes you to be exposed. Uh, Situation, some uh, decision you make causes uh, that sin to come to the top. So he says in verse 19, For from the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, uh, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies, and uh, these are things that defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Jesus says that sin originates in the heart. He doesn't give an exhaustive list of, list of sins, but he does, he does point out a few. But I think it's interesting that he, start, he starts that list with the thoughts. The thoughts, because that's where everything starts. So my friend, who had an affair on his wife, it, didn't, it wasn't sudden. It didn't just happen, as some people say. It started with a thought. You know, she's pretty. I wonder if she, wonder if she is attracted to me. I'm attracted to her. How about I say this flirtatious comment and see what she says back? Oh, she reciprocated. Well, that's, that's interesting. You know, uh, then you go further and further and further. But it starts in the mind. It starts as a thought. So, and it starts in the heart. Since, since our hearts and minds and bodies are all bound together to make our soul, it makes sense that what is in the heart, our intentions, will make their way to our minds. And once in our minds, move to our actions. Like I said, my friend's adultery was not uh, sudden, but it did begin in, uh, inwardly. So Aaron Beck, he's a 98-year-old uh, uh, psychologist. He uh, developed uh, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy, which is... Uh, a way of, of, of treating uh, patients. So uh, he revolutionized the field of psychology and psychiatry by moving away from the Freudian and behavioral therapies and that dominated the, dominated the profession in uh, the 1950s and 60s. His theory stems from the brain research, uh, but his ideas were actually founded in scripture. So what he says is, what you think affects the way you feel. What you feel affects the way you act. So change the way you think and you'll change the way you act. And you can could, you could see this. You get up on a Monday morning, the coffee machine's broke. And you think in your mind, that's going to be a terrible day. I've got a lot going on, and now my coffee machine broke. You get outside, you got a flat tire. Now you're thinking, man, this day's just doomed. It's doomed. There's no way I can recover. I might as well go back to bed, not go to work. But you go without coffee. You get your tire repaired. You get in your car. You drive to work. And now what you think has affected the way that you feel about yourself in the day. You walk into work and, and now everybody sees you. Your head's down. Your shoulders are drooped. You go to your desk and it just begins to impact you. And that's how it does. But even further than that, if you think in terms of being a Christian, what you think affects the way you feel. So Jesus said, guard your mind. Uh, how you feel affects the way you act. So uh, if we have the right thoughts about who we are in Christ, then we have the right feeling about uh, our identity. How you act affects the way other people view you, your character and your reputation. How people view you should be a reflection of Christ. 
So if we have the right mind and the right heart, we're going to have the right actions, character, reputation. Take all your uh, thoughts captive and allow them to remain in Christ and you'll reflect Him. Following Christ means allowing the Holy Spirit to transform your heart and your mind. You have to die to yourself daily. When you do, your actions and character will follow. Never follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Following your heart might get you into trouble. The old, what is it, at the end of uh, Napoleon Dynamite, he tells Pedro, Pedro, just follow your heart. Uh, but our hearts are selfish and, they have, and they're sinful and they can lead us astray. In Jeremiah, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. If Proverbs, in Proverbs, it says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And Luke, it says, the good person out of the good treasure of their heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil produces, uh, evil treasures produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the, heart, of the heart that the mouth speaks. So what is in the heart will come out of your mouth. So this bottle of water right here, there's water in here. So if I squeeze it, what's going to come out? Okay, if I shake it, what's coming out? Can Coke come out? Can coffee come out? Can sand? Only water. So what you put into your heart is what's going to come out in every situation. Uh, what you listen to, what you watch, the people you uh, have fellowship with, uh, you know, always enters your thoughts and your mind. So uh, my brother-in-law, he played Division One football. And he said, it's tough being in a locker room with those guys because you always hear the things they say and the, the crass things they say and they go on and on and on. He said, after a while, it began to seep into my heart. So that in certain situations, if I was angry or, you know, kind of stumped, he said, I would, I would say words I shouldn't say. He said, I began to realize it, it was seeping into my heart and I needed to find a way to keep it out. But what's in the heart can also be revealed in the most likely, unlikeliest of times. So... Um, I'm usually laid back. Uh, it's really difficult to make me angry, uh, but I guess it happens. Uh, but I was uh, at Lowe's with my friend Miguel. Miguel, he, he's, uh, he's the handyman I wish I was. And uh, so we were doing, uh, replacing a faucet in the bathroom. So he went with me because I don't know what I need, but I kind of know what I want. So I looked online, I saw the faucet that I, that I wanted. And uh, so we went up to Lowe's, I think in Timmons Corner, and we walked in. And so I go to the aisle in the bay that it says it's in. I look up. The display's there. But the one I want is not in, the, in that bay, in the opening. And so I was like, man, I don't want to go anywhere to try to find this thing. And so I, w- I was going to see it. Maybe if it was another store, I might think about going. So I walked over to this lady. I was like, hey, can you help me? Uh, she said, uh, yeah, just a minute. And she said it kind of like gruff. Like maybe I was interrupting something she was doing. And, uh, and it kind of like kind of raised my antenna a little bit. I was like, well, fine, whatever, she's busy. So I went back over there uh, and still trying to find it, and she was still busy. So I walked back over again, and I said, hey, uh, do you mind helping me? And she said, I guess. You know, kind of short. And again, kind of raised my antenna, but whatever. So we walked over there, and, uh, and I said, look, the one I want uh, is not here. The one above it is very similar to it, but it's $10 more. Can you sell me that one for the price of the one below it? And she said, No. I was like, you can't? Are you sure you can't? I mean, surely, a, a store this size, you could sell me something for $10 off. You know, I mean, you're still making money off of it, right? And uh, she said, I can't do it. So she walked away, and another guy came by. And I said, hey, man, uh, that faucet I want is out of stock, but the one above it is there. Could you sell me that one for $10 less because the one I want's not there? And he said, I'm not real sure about that. And the lady who had walked away from across the department said, he just asked me that question, and I told him no. And, uh, and I said, well, look, look, hey, can we get a manager? And the guy said, well, she's the manager. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I have my Baptist Children's Home shirt on, and I'm, I'm, I said something to her, and she said something snarky back to me, and then I walked uh, down the aisle, and then she was across the aisle. She heard me say something to Miguel about her. I was like, man, I can't believe she can't, you know, just make this happen. And so she came out from a, like across the aisle. Like she was following us. And uh, she said, uh, where do you work? Because she saw my shirt. She said, what does it say on your shirt? And man, I just, I just melted. And uh, so I showed her my shirt. And she said, the Alabama Baptist Children's Songs. No way. Oh, and I just, 
all my pride melted, all my guard that was up came down. And I realized that what I was doing, I was being a poor example of Christ. And I was called out. I was exposed because of what in my, was in my heart was beginning to spill out. Uh, it was not a good example. So I said, hey, look, forget it. I'm sorry. I should have acted that way. I should have said things I said. Uh, I apologize. Uh, if it's not here, that's fine. If you can't give it to me for a cheaper price, I'll go somewhere else. And uh, she said, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't altogether uh, attentive in the beginning. I did kind of snap at you. I was busy and I, and, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. I said, I probably didn't help the situation. So, so in Lowe's, we hugged it out. And, uh, and so, so, every, so every time I see her, I, I say hello to her and I hug her. Uh, I hadn't seen her in a while. But, but what was in my heart came out. So we went to the, um, to the truck and Miguel got in the truck and cranked it up. And he's been working with me probably 10 years. So he knows me pretty well. Every day, well, no, we don't see each other every day. But most days we see each other. We hang out, we go to lunch. And he turned to me and he said, what's wrong with you? He said, I've never seen you act that way. Are you okay? I said, I don't, I don't know if I am. Because my heart uh, needed examining. I needed to find out what was coming uh, from the inside. And so, how's your heart today? Examine your heart. Think about where you are. Maybe there's some things in your life, uh, in your heart, that maybe you don't even realize. Are you angry with a brother or sister? Uh, and you're harboring some, some grudge? You don't really speak to them anymore because of what they did to you or said to you or said about you? Are you looking at someone who seems to have it all together and sort of wishing they would fail? Are you uh, speaking ill about someone else, gossiping? Check your heart. Find out uh, what it is making you do these things. So I want to share four things that you can do to keep your heart in check. One is understand that it's not about sinning, but about experiencing Christ in a deeper relationship. It's not about keeping yourself free from all the things you do or don't do. It's about building that relationship so that what's inside the Spirit of, of God flows out of you and creates the fruit of the Spirit so that you don't have to work on these things. They just come as part of who you are and what Christ has made you. When we simply reduce our lives to not sinning, we, quick, we quickly become just like the Pharisees. Um, it, it simply becomes about following rules and not being... Um, you know, <laughs> following rules and regulations, but it's not about being uh, devoted to Christ and knowing him and being filled with his presence. If we're constantly uh, filling our hearts uh, with Christ and his presence, our hearts are uh, less in less danger of being evil. So we need to fill our hearts uh, with the things of Christ. Secondly, I must die to myself daily and practice regular checkups. In order to examine, uh, experience Christ more, uh, we need his fullness. We must die to ourselves and place him in the center of our heart. Part of dying to ourselves involves remembering who we are, one, in Christ, but also who we were without Christ. We were desperate for a Savior. Sin deceives us into thinking that we deserve something, when in fact, we deserve death. And, but Christ paid that price on the cross Sin can also deceive us by getting us to compare ourselves to others. Well, I'm not as bad as he is. I mean, he's out here doing this, and I'm, I'm going to church, and I'm doing the right thing, and I'm serving in a ministry. And so I can look at the outward appearance of who I am without really, truly examining my heart. Uh, the Pharisees were great at the comparison game. It's important for me to examine my heart, to know who I really am. So it, you think of yourself as first sinner, and second, sinned against. A lot of times when somebody does something against us or says something about us, we think, oh, they sinned, against, you know, they, they sinned against me. We think, oh, they hurt my feelings or, you know, they, they did this to me. But if you think of yourself first as sinner, then you're more able to extend grace to those who don't really want to give you grace. You're more uh, able to extend the love of Christ to those who might not say nice things about you, who might not like you. But allow... Uh, yourself to understand that you are sin you are a sinner saved by grace and three we must be honest with ourselves we crave fulfillment we need fulfillment uh, and the only way we can have true fulfillment is through through our relationship to God through Jesus Christ uh, we can't be filling our our hearts with these things that are only temporary and it may be a temporary satisfaction but in the end it leaves us empty we need to fill ourselves uh, with the contentment of Christ. So we, we crave fulfillment. Uh, if you don't believe me, go look on Facebook. 
So somebody looks at their post and they say, man, look, I got, I got 30 comments and 100 likes. Man, that was a really good post. And it's such a small thing. It's like, I think of it as cotton candy. It's so, it's so insignificant and, and fleeting. Um, but we, we crave that fulfillment. Even in social media, we, we want it. But more significantly, in, in our spouses and our others around us. And if we're not receiving that, we, we go out and try to, to, to have it fulfilled another way. Maybe through a hobby or through a friend or through something else. But only true contentment comes through Christ. And the last one is we must have accountability. So Miguel that day at Lowe's was accountability for me. He saw something different in my life and said, that's not you. What's going on? You need people in your life who can speak into your life, who, who can see something's wrong. And you can share maybe your struggles with that person. And I get it's hard. It's hard to be transparent with people because you feel like if I tell them something that I struggle with, then they know that. And that thing is out here and there's nothing you can do about it. Transparency and authenticity are really hard, but man, they're worth it. They're worth it to have someone that you can trust and confide in and say, here's what I need you to keep me accountable for. I need you to ask me every time you see me, have you had your quiet time? Are you staying free of this sin? Are you, are you uh, not giving in to this habit? Whatever it is, find somebody who you trust who can be that person for you. We need each other. God created us to live in community with other believers. Together we're able to do and overcome more than we can just by ourselves. So we need each other. We need accountability. So this morning, as the um, musicians make their way up, I want to ask you a question. How's your heart? When was the last time you had a, a checkup? I want you even now to examine your heart and look for even the smallest place where sin can hide. Look in the, in the smallest place where you haven't given it over to God. Either in your seat or at the altar, allow God to search your heart and ask him by the power of God to reveal to you and remove sin so you can experience him in a more intimate way. He wants to show you. He wants to be close to you. He wants to weed those things out of your life so that you can have fulfillment in Jesus Christ. When you see something in your heart, acknowledge that it's there and then repent of it. Let's do that now. Let me pray. Lord, I just thank you.